Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully, there we go, we have our slides. So uh, it's great to follow Brendan. Um, as um, Simon mentioned, I'm Irene Ross, and I work at um, a company called Boku. We're an open web technology company where we work to make open source uh, a viable alternative to closed source software. And uh, while I'm here today uh, alone, um, I, there's another name on my slides for Mike Panisi, who is my collaborator and what I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, and without him, I really couldn't be here. So I just want to um, say thanks to him. Um, and uh, if I could actually have my slides, thanks. Um, so, um, so the slide, um, the, the talk title is the ABC of Data Visualization, which is actually uh, a terrible title and is kind of a, more of a decoy. Because what I really want to talk about today is architecting better charts. Uh, because most of the time, um, while what I really do is work in this data pipeline of cleaning up data and transforming it, and then analyzing it and visualizing it, and realizing it's not quite right, and going into this loop of trying to find what is the message, what is the story, um, in reality, when we're done with that part, we get to visualize it for the web, which is really the most exciting part. And so we've been working a lot at Boku with D3.js. We really love D3. We feel that D3 is a little bit like uh, what jQuery is for the web. It helps us put data visualization together incredibly fast. Uh, and we use it a lot with clients and open source work. But a lot of the time, what happens with D3 is this. D3 is a very complex library. There's a lot of functionality in it. Uh, and there's kind of a culture of copy and paste sharing that is dri driven by a lot of examples being put out there. And it's really exciting because people get to learn. Uh, and we've all copy and pasted code in every library. But uh, what it does result in is this uh, kind of a code spaghetti situation that we really want to avoid. And because we at Boku believe so strongly in releasing uh, your code and writing your code in a way that is shareable, uh, we started thinking about what does it really mean to architect data visualization. And when I say architect, what I really talk about is making reusable charts, right? Because the reality, what we want to do uh, is, is create these visualizations and share them with others so that they can use them uh, themselves, and even in our own future projects. Because in practice, uh, cleaning and organizing and architecting your code is good not just for other people, but for yourself as well. And so what I wanted to do is actually start today and talk about what are the four principles of creating reusable charts. And so we're going to break those down and then uh, hopefully tell you something really exciting uh, about those four. So the first being, uh, creating, when you create something reusable, it means that it is repeatable. right? Note there's kind of difficulty stars in the corner. As we go through these, you'll see it'll get a little bit more challenging. And so what I mean by that is if I have a constructor for making a bar chart, well, I can go ahead and create quite a few uh, bar charts. Um, the next one being configurable. Uh, so if I have a specific uh, constructor, again, like the bar chart constructor, I can give my users a little bit of flexibility in terms of customizing what it is they get back. So for example, here, I can change the fill color, or I can change the orientation of the bar chart. The next one is extensibility, right? Ideally, if I create a uh, basic chart uh, of some sort, then I can build a next one that it not only inherits that original behavior, but is also adding new functionality to it. So for example, here, if I have, again, my bar chart, uh, I can add a little bit of extra functionality, perhaps adding some labels or changing the shape of the original chart. And last but not least, uh, coming in with four stars of difficulty, uh, if you break down a chart, you'll actually see that there are a lot of common components that are made up across uh, different types of charts. So for example, if I have a bar chart, and I take an axis, and then I take some labels and put them together, well, then I get a bar chart that has some numbers on it. right? Uh, and if you think about it, a lot of data visualization can be broken up in this way. And if you've written a lot of data visualization, you'll find yourself really rewriting the same things over and over. And so the reason I'm here today is because we've been thinking about this for probably close to a year now, uh, and thinking about those principles and putting them together. Uh, and I'm really excited today to announce a new project from the MISO project, which we've been working about uh, on for over about uh, six months, called D3 Chart. Uh, and D3 Chart is a framework for creating reusable charts with D3. What it is not is a library of charts. There are no charts with D3 Chart. Uh, what it is, uh, except those that you will contribute and that we've contributed so far uh, and to hopefully create uh, a larger community of, um, of chart creators. And so this is the part where, if you want, you can stop paying attention to me and go look at the code and the website. Uh, and most importantly, there are two blog posts that we've put up on the Boku blog, one talking about the reusability concept in great, great detail that Mike had written uh, and is a really incredibly thorough article, uh, and the second one actually uh, announcing the specific library and giving you some details about how it works. Uh, 
Uh, but I, I do want to continue and actually do that with you guys today. Uh, and I'm going to start off by giving you the fastest crash course to D3 ever. Uh, and I'm sorry that I only have about 30 seconds to do it, but hopefully some of you have used D3 so far. Uh, and what we're going to do is start off by creating this incredibly basic chart. As you see, I've painted some blue circles along the x-axis, and each circle is positioned in accordance with a data element from my data array that is at the top of that code. And so when I create a D3 chart, there are a few things that I do pretty much every single time. First, I'm going to create a container for that chart using a D3 selection. So all I'm saying here is I'm going to, I'm going to select uh, an element of the ID viz and then put in an SVG element and give it some sizing. And next, I'm going to create a container into which I'm going to put some kind of a visual marker that is rendered based on my data. So in this case, these are circles. And I'm going to go ahead and actually create a group element into which those are going to go. And then this is one of the really tricky parts, is where I'm going to prepare my container by indicating that what I'm going to do is bind data to a bunch of circles. And this is where people get these two kind of um, uh, inverted, if you will, because first you have to say, I'm going to select some circles, and then I'm going to bind data to them. And this is a pretty fixed kind of pattern in D3. Uh, and next, I'm going to uh, actually go ahead and append those circles and say, uh, now that I, um, every time that a new data point comes in, uh, I'm going to have a circle appended for it. Um, and what I also do is then go ahead and specify some attributes that will help me render what those circles are actually going to look like. So note here, I'm positioning them on the, y, uh, on the y axis at 100 and then giving them a radius and a fill. Uh, and then I'm also going to go ahead and actually add um, a, a more data driven attribute, right, which is our X positioning. And so this is really D3 uh, in a nutshell. Obviously, it's much more complicated and robust than that. But if you have to create a basic chart, you, you'll follow sort of a very similar pattern. So we're going to go ahead and do that now, except use D3 chart together. So hopefully you guys can see the code. But this is my definition of a circle chart, a reusable chart. Note that I have a new API call on D3 called chart. We add that um, using our library. Uh, and what we're going to go ahead, uh, once we initialize uh, our constructor for the circle chart, is go ahead and add a layer, which is, again, just a set of visual elements that are drawn to your data. And we added this construct of layer to help you separate the different parts of your chart that are going to be driven by that data. And so in this case, our circles uh, is what we're going to name the layer. And then we're going to put it inside of a new group element that is forked off of the base of the chart. If you remember that SVG that we're going to create, this is just going to be a group element inside. Uh, and then we're going to uh, pass a bunch of functions inside. So there's three different important parts to creating a layer. The first one is, again, declaring that we wish to render those circles and bind the data. And conveniently, we have a method that you, that you define called data bind that lets you do that. Note, it takes in the data. Um, where, again, what, this is where you would do any sort of uh, you know, um, editing of your data and so on and so forth before you go ahead and bind it to, uh, to whatever it is you're going to bind it to. And the next step is uh, actually uh, inserting those elements. So we have an insert method, again, very logical, hopefully, uh, where we actually go ahead and insert our circles uh, and maybe set up any kind of uh, properties that are not data driven. And the third part, and really exciting part, is this idea of lifecycle events. So if you think about it, when you create a chart, you may want to put data in it that is changing. Imagine you're, you're pulling, or you have WebSocket uh, data, uh, data coming via WebSockets. Um, and you may want to uh, draw it multiple times without having to re-render your chart every time. And so uh, what happens to that data when the data is changed, right? So lifecycle events uh, allow you to basically specify exactly what the chart should do in all the different situations. There are four different types of lifecycle events. First, update. And that's what happens to elements that have already been, dr uh, been drawn, and the data stays the same. Enter, which is what should happen to new uh, elements when new data comes in. Merge is what should happen to both of those once they're already printed on the screen, because when that happens, uh, they're effectively merged into a single unit. And exit, which is what should happen to our elements when the data point no longer exists in the data that we've just drawn. And so there's also four matching transition events, which give you back the ability to actually animate um, all those functionality. And so here, what we're doing is just specifying the enter uh, or what should happen to brand new nodes as they come into the stage. Again, we just position them along the x-axis and give them a few functions. And so last but not least, we actually have to instantiate our chart. So notes that this looks very really similar to what we've done before, except now we have this one extra method called chart. And what that basically does is says, hey, this selection that I just created, let me designate that as the, as the circle chart. And then I'm going to go ahead and draw the data. And that is pretty much all you have to do. And now you've created this reusable chart that you can go ahead uh, and instantiate multiple times. 
So let's see how it is we've done on our four categories. First, repeatability. Uh, I'd say we've done pretty well. Here we are instantiating two different charts and two different containers, uh, drawing completely different data, uh, pretty self-explanatory. In terms of configuration, uh, if you've used D3, you know that getters and setters are, tend to be the same functions in D3. If you provide a parameter, then it's a setter. And if you don't, then it's a getter. And so if you've noticed in the previous definition, we had an initialized function, which is what happens when you initialize a chart. But we can also add our own getters and setters. So in this case, we're uh, adding a function called fill that lets us actually uh, color the circles uh, according to a certain way. And so uh, as you can see, we're just using that fill directly inside of our lifecycle event callback. And so when a user goes ahead and instantiates that chart, they get this extra API method. Right? This is really handy because um, this still looks a lot like D3, except it's one single API call. And it allows your users to really keep their code uh, a lot smaller. Uh, and so again, we made our circles blue, and we have some blue circles there. Uh, our third step is extensibility. So uh, in this case, we've created a circle chart, but we've decided that it's a little bit boring. And what we really would like to do is add some labels to it. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is actually uh, extend our chart. So uh, as you notice that it looks very, very similar, except I have this extend method that I can call right off of the D3 chart function. Uh, and here I'm going to create a brand uh, new chart called circles with number chart, which is really creative. Uh, and inside, I'm going to do something incredibly similar. I'm going to add a new layer. I'm going to add a layer that's going to contain labels inside of a new group. And then I'm going to position them uh, exactly the same way. And so what that's going to give me, uh, as you can see in the bottom, is blue circles with a bunch of numbers on top. Uh, but again, in terms of instantiating it, it really didn't take me any more work. And note that I still had all the API from the previous function. So you might ask your, um, from the previous chart. You might ask yourself, uh, where do the circles come from? Where, again, because we were extending the previous chart, we get all the functionality that we've already defined uh, along with the functionality that we're adding. And so last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about uh, composability, uh, which is our hardest one. And uh, this is where the code gets really crazy. Uh, if you remember our circle chart, we've just talked about that. And imagine that instead of having the label chart just be an extension of the circles, imagine that I have my own label chart. And all it does is it draws labels along the x-axis. Because if you think about it, a lot of things have labels that may have to be drawn in that way. And so conveniently, what I can do is just go ahead and define a much, uh, a much smaller chart that just draws the labels for me, and then put them together. Uh, by creating a, this brand new chart. I call it CL chart. Um, and in it, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to use a, another API that we are adding called Mixin that actually lets us mix in one chart into another. So in this case, we're mixing in a circle chart, and we're mixing in a label chart. And then what we're going to go ahead and, uh, and do is instantiate it and get exactly what it is we just saw. So the nice thing about that is if you think about uh, the fact that tomorrow I might have a rectangle chart, or maybe I want to take my label chart and position those labels along the y-axis too, effectively giving me some sort of a scatter plot. Um, this way, I did not compromise the integrity of my first label chart. It still exists, and I can extend it into new charts and mix it into um, to other charts. And so this is uh, really all I had to tell you today. I'm really excited to uh, finally launch this work. We've been working on it for a really long time. And we're excited to hear back from the D3 community. Uh, we've worked very closely with the patterns that they're already familiar with, things like chaining. You notice there were no new keywords, um, uh, because that is just not how D D3 tends to work. Uh, and uh, we're really excited to sort of see what you guys build. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, the repository is there. It's heavily documented, both on the MISO project website and on the wiki uh, of the repository. We have a template that you can start using right away to build your charts. We have a few charts that we started publishing. And throughout the next few weeks, we're going to publish more and more and more charts. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to, to hear what you all think. So thank you for your time. And uh, thank you to uh, Boku and, and, uh, and Mike. It was a pleasure to work with all of them uh, on this great work. So thank you.